failed you. Welcome back to another episode of Crown of Beehive Short Stories and Poetry. I'm Terrence O'Donnell, your village scholar, returning again this week with more stories and poems from authors around the world. I have three stories and a poem for you this week. The second story is a bit lengthy, but worth your patience. First up is a short romantic horror story about the effects of utter loneliness. The second is a fictional coming-of-age story. The third is a dystopian story of a failed world. And last, a poem written in tribute to Gaza and the Palestinians. So gather around once more and let me read to you under the shade of the crown of Bia, the tree of life. So my first story is entitled Lady Saltitude, a romantic, she calls it a romantic mystery flash fiction by Catherine Elaine. And she writes this from her Substack page. Please, don't leave. Stay just a bit longer, he begged, while she was already slipping away from his embrace. I can't stay, she replied softly. His lover was a secret he feared to share even with himself. Or rather, he was afraid she wasn't real. Loneliness had choked him ever since he moved into this old house. After his fiancée dumped him, after he lost his job and was forced to leave the big city lights, the silence of this small town poisoned his mind until it made him sick. He was ready to end his pathetic life, when one evening a month ago she turned up in his bed. She appeared to have materialized from the loneliness itself. She never told her name, and he never asked. To him, she was Lady Saltitude, a black-haired beauty with warm skin, round curves, and sweet lips. She gave herself to him with the lightness of a short, hot summer's night, always leaving too soon. She was perfect, passionate, and gentle. The few words they spoke were always the ones he needed to hear, except when she was leaving. Her farewell stung his heart with the cruelty of the sharp rays of the morning sun. She was the night, his lady solitude, his refuge, and his only friend. He did not fear ghosts, never had. Strange boy who loved ghost stories grew up to be a strange, lonely man. He wouldn't mind her being a ghost, yet her warmth and the reality of her touch puzzled him. He felt deep scars on her wrist as he caressed her skin. One morning he woke with cut marks on his own wrist. He hadn't seen those since his teen years. Did he cut himself at night? All he remembered was Lady Solida's nearness. Her body responded to him eagerly while he kissed every inch of her. He grew restless, so he went to the local library and dug through the archives. No wonder the rent was so cheap. He found old newspaper clippings. A serial killer lived and died there in his house. A woman, who drugged and kidnapped men to torture them for weeks, then cut them to death. She killed herself by cutting her wrist after police found her five victims buried in the old guard behind the house. He shivered. It all added up, except... The woman in a photo looked nothing like his lady Saltative. Was she living only in his head? If so, he didn't wish the dream to stop, even if it would become a nightmare. Lady Saltitude appeared out of nowhere as usual. He didn't ask questions. After they made love, he felt a cold blade touching his wrist. I love you. I don't care what you are or what you do to me. Just don't leave me, he whispered as she smiled down on him in the dark. My second story is entitled When the Wave Comes, a coming-of-age story from another world by Richard D., published in the Kraken Lore. Mother, I'm scared, Rick announced. Why, she asked. When the wave comes, I'm scared that I'll run, and then I'll be killed deaf, and I won't have a family or future, and I will have to be a slave all my life. The words came out in a rush. His mother put her arm around him. He was small for his age, and it was true that he was not physically imposing like his father or brothers, even the younger ones. But he was her favorite for his quiet intelligence and willingness to help. Now then, she told him, it's natural to be scared. Every boy is. They might not admit it, but they are. The way will prove that you are an adult, and then you won't be killed at. But Drawer says that I will run and that I won't even dare to turn up at the ancestor's wall. Drawer was of an age with Rick, but large, loud, and outwardly confident, everything that Rick was not. 
Naturally, he was looking forward to the wave to prove his manhood. No one thought the drawer would run, or that he would not survive the wave. After the wave, you will be able to choose a second name, said his mother. Everyone will know that you faced the wave and did not run. I will be even more proud of you, and your father will take you into the craftsman's guild. Take no notice of drawer. His only brother is Keldaf, and it upsets him because your brothers are not, and he has no father to teach him. Of course, his family does not talk of it. Just be strong in yourself. Rick left his dwelling and walked through the city streets, unconsciously heading towards the wall of the ancestors that lay at the eastern edge of the island city of Keth. The fields were full of ripening crops, and there were Keldav toiling over them, watched by men. There were three moons in the sky. Rick knew that once a full cycle, when all four moons were in alignment with the sun, a larger-than-usual tide was generated, running around the planet and sweeping all the island cities with a huge wave. All those males approaching adulthood stood outside the wall on a sandy beach and let the wave wash over them. Those who remained after its passage were acclaimed as men and could marry and take second names. Those who would not stand or who ran were killed out, cowards and fit only for servitude and ridicule. They were dead men walking, thought Rick, bound by law to do whatever they were told by anyone, even women and children. Even the ones who vanished were better thought of. At least they had shown courage. They were mourned and revered, their spirits watching over the city. There were three days to the wave. Already the wall was thronged with people. Scraps of parchment had been pushed into the cracks in its brickwork. Prayers for those who would take the wave, and some for those who had vanished in previous years. Rick stood at the edge and looked out to the east. The sun-dappled water was still, and waves gently lapped at the wide beach a hundred feet below him. He knew that the wave would break just below where he stood. He had seen it last year when his brother Aaron had emerged triumphant in his wake. Aaron, who was now married and soon to be a father. Rick wanted what Aaron had more than anything. Dror pushed his way through the crowds until he stood beside Rick, taller and heavily built. He jabbed Rick in the ribs. Hello, small one, he grinned. You're early. There are three days to go yet, or are you just working out which way you will run? Rick felt himself color at the insult. I'm not frightened of the wave, or of you, he replied. I'm not like your brother. I won't run. But his expression gave way his real thoughts. Dror grabbed Rick's arm and twisted up behind his back. Don't you talk of my brother, he hissed. I have no brother. Rick winced. It was almost worth the pain to see Dror's confidence crumble. I have brothers, he continued. They oversee Keldav. The implication was clear, and Rick stood on his tiptoes as Dror increased the pressure on his arm. Suddenly he let go. Rick wondered why. Then he saw that Laris, the daughter of his neighbor, had joined him. Hello, Rick, she said. Are you excited yet? She ignored Dror and looked at Rick with more than interest. They had grown up together, and it was expected by their families that if Rick survived, they would eventually marry. She was the same height as Rick, with her hair like a black curtain and the first signs of womanhood. Rick felt his heart lurch. Laris turned heads, and she was interested in him. No wonder Dror was upset. He had designs on her, too. That would be why he let go. Laris had remarked about his bullying before. Hello, Laris, said Dror quickly, pushing Rick away. You won't be quite so interested in him when he runs. You'll be better off with me than that Keldad. Laris sprung to Rick's defense. Well, I think that he will stand, and when he does, it will prove him worthy. When you both survive, you will have to stop trying to belittle him. Dror's gaze narrowed. You don't think that he will be man enough for you, do you? He sneered. You'll be far better off with me. He will never stand. It was contempt in his voice. Rick felt tears welling up in his eyes. He was stung by the tone of Dror's voice and frightened that he was right. He had to go. Before Laris could see them, he turned and walked away. He could hear Dror's jeers ringing in his ears. Look at him. He's not even here and he's off. That night, Rick lay in his bed listening to his parents talking. I worry for him, said his father for I don't think he will be strong enough to stand. He is too small. Look at his brothers. They were bigger, and yet they could not survive. Be still, said his mother, and have faith. There is strength in him. It's just that he doesn't realize it yet. I agree that he is stronger than he realizes. I don't think for one moment he will run, continued his father. 
It's just that he is not physically strong enough to resist the force of the water, try as he will. Rick felt strangely comforted by the words. Surely he reasoned he would not need as much strength if he was smaller. Eventually he slept, his dreams filled with waves and taunts. Rick kept away from Jor and Laris for the next two days. It wasn't fair, he thought. Jor had everything and made him feel small by his presence. He knew that Jor thought he was not just up to the challenge of the wave. He resolved to prove him wrong. On the day before the wave, his father took him into the forest to pick his staff. It must be a green wood, he explained, that will be strong and supple. The length is twice your height. One end is pushed deep into the sand of the beach, and you hold the other. Rick nodded. His father was wise, and everyone thought so. Rick valued every scarce second that he spent with him. Between them, they scoured the coppice trees for a good staff. Rick chose several, but his father dismissed them all, pointing out flaws in the grain. The day was passing, and they must find one soon. Others were searching as well. Lost in thought, there was little conversation between the searchers. Jor was not among them. He must be looking elsewhere for his staff. Of course, he had no father to help him. The shame of Keldav had been too much, and he had simply vanished one morning. Jor was convinced that his father would return to see him stand. Everyone else thought he had taken the chance to slip away and sail to another island, there to start again. You must not rush your choice. You need a straight and true staff, his father said, like this one. Rick saw a branch that was as thick as his arm, straight and solid. His father cut it from the trunk and handed it to Rick. It felt alive in his hand, not too heavy to hold, and as he flexed it he could feel the power in the grain, forcing it straight against his muscles. You will know if it is yours, said his father, watching his son with the branch. He will feel part of you. This is the one, then, said Rick. Come, we will fix leather straps on it so that you will not lose it. His father led him home in the gathering dark. Now I will tell you how best to prepare yourself for what is coming. It started in the ocean deeps, halfway around the world from Keth. The moon's alignment pulled the oceans up, and the spin of the planet sent a great wave racing around the world. The first thing that the inhabitants of the island cities knew of the waves coming was in the lowering of the tide. Instead of its usual ebb, the water level sank lower than it had been for a full cycle. In each of the cities, the elders signaled the arrival of the wave, the chance for all those brave enough to prove their manhood. The great bell on Kath tolled at sunrise. Rick was woken from sleep by the sound of the bell and his father's call. Come now, son, it's time to go to the wall. To his father, this day was familiar and tinged with pride and sadness, as well as standing himself. He had had seven sons. Four had already stood for the wave. Only two had returned. Rick roused himself and prepared for his ordeal. He dressed simply. Nothing was allowed that would help him stand, except the leather bindings on the staff of greenwood that he had cut and trimmed. As was the custom, if he survived, it would form part of his proof that he had stood. His father's staff hung over the stone fireplace in their home. It had been dried by years of fire smoke and twisted into a curve. Rick had always longed to have his own to display proudly. If he returned, today would be his day. As he made his way to the wall, the crowds thronged around him. He hadn't realized that there were so many people in the city. People he didn't know slapped him on the back and wished him good luck. The city elder started the ceremony as the new tide welled. Standing on top of the wall, he called down the spirits of the ancients, to bless the passing of boys into men, and led prayers for those who would not return. Next, a list of all those who were of age to stand was read out. Rick and Drawer answered their names, but there were several who were not present. At the end of the calling, the elder declared, All those who have not answered are now Keldown. They will be so marked. I declare them slaves to those who stand and return. He gestured to the horizon. A faint dark line was visible on the top of the sea. Take your places as boys, return as men, he chanted, and the crowd began to repeat the call, their voices swelling in the morning light. Go as boys, return as men. The boys were led down to the beach and formed into a line facing the east. Rick and Drawer were close together in the middle of a long line of boys. At a command from the elder, the greenwood staffs were dug into the soft gold and sand, angled toward the horizon, whilst the crowd continued chanting at their backs, Go as boys, return as men. Go as boys, return as men. Rick wound the leather straps around his wrist 
and set his feet apart, digging them into the sand and pebbles, just as his father had shown him. Over the chant, a soft hum could be heard, growing louder as the wave neared. The water level was rising fast now. It lapped around the feet of the group of boys, now around their ankles. As a group, they leant forward. Suddenly, the water drained away, leaving them exposed, a line of feeble bodies in the face of the onrushing wall of green water, backlit by the rising sun. There was a shout, and then a growl from the crowd above them on the wall. Rick took his eyes off the wave and looked left. The boy between him and Drawer, and three others further down the beach, had turned and run from the wave. Dropping their staffs, they fled up the beach and into the safety of the city behind the wall. The crowd's chant changed. Kel down, Kel down, they cried, the chant of the coward. These were as bad as the ones that had not arrived. They had failed to become men. The deserters' futures would be joined to the others in the slavery. They would all be laborers with the red mark of Keldav on their heads. Drawer turned to Rick, shouting over the noise of the rushing water. You're leaving it late, he sneered. About time you ran, isn't it? His voice was faint over the roar of the wave. It was slowing now in the shallows, but it was rising. Now it towered above them and started to break, a line of white foam visible on its crest. I'm not going anywhere, replied Rick. He took a deep breath and braced himself as the wave fell on the group felt to Rick as if all the air was knocked out of his body. He was pushed backwards. His staff was almost torn from his grip. The water was cold and numbed him. The ground under his feet shifted and he felt himself tumbling head over heels, staff flailing. As he was carried along by the swirling water, he felt another body bump into him. He clutched at his waist and legs, hampering his efforts as he tried to anchor his staff back into the sand. He was aware of the presence of the wall and thought he would soon be dashed into it. Desperation made him stronger than he thought he could be. The grip of the other boy slackened, but an arm caught under his belt and the body hung like a weight. The water was filled with sand and pebbles, blinding him, but as he was carried up the beach and into shallower water, he could make out the surface and could feel the force of the wave weakening. His lungs were bursting as he managed to push his staff into the sand holding the two bodies against the last of the wave's energy. His head broke the surface, and he <gasps> sucked in a deep breath. The wave had passed, and he was alive. He had stood. He had been pushed back nearly to the foot of the wall, but had not struck it. He could hear cheering and crying from the top of the wall as the water level dropped until he was standing on dry sand. Looking around him, he made out a small group of men. They were not boys now, but it saddened him to see such a small number of them. He realized that the other body was still attached to his belt and looked down. He saw that it was Drawer. He was unconscious. His staff had split. Only a short piece of wood was still attached to his wrist by the leather straps. He untangled Drawer's arm and shook it. Come on, Drawer, wake up, he shouted, but the boy didn't move. Laris came running down the beach toward him on long legs, damp sand flying up with each step. She was at the head of a group of relatives and friends who went to the survivors and held them. Rick, she called, flinging her arms around his neck. I'm so proud of you. Dror was lost, but you held him. He was only a man because of you. Rick was both pleased and dismayed. He had stood, but Dror had emerged from the wave. Would he still live to taunt him? Dror's mother had arrived on the sands. She knelt and shook her son. Dror jerked, coughed, and spluttered and moaned weakly. He vomited a large amount of water and dribbled down the front of his robe. Kneeling, the three of them helped him sit up. His hair and face were covered with sand, but his eyes focused on them as he regained his senses. If I stood, he asked weakly. Rick nodded. Yes, we are still here. Listen. Above them, the bell sounded, and the elder called down. You who remain are men because you stood. Come and take your place among the men of Keth. Rick saw that his parents were at the head of the throng, hurrying down to the beach. They were together with Laris's. Hopefully, I will be wed to Laris soon, thought Rick. Now that I'm a man, we can build a dwelling, and I can hand my staff over the fire. You never ran, Dan, said Dror, ending his thoughts of marriage. No, he answered proudly. I never considered it, despite what you thought. And it's a good job he didn't, answered Laris. He held you firm and true. We saw it all from the wall. What do you mean, asked Rick. There was something in her tone. Dror's mother answered. When the wave started to break, my son was washed off his feet. As he passed, you held him tight. Although you were uprooted, you never let him go. Rick thought that things had happened in a different way to that. He looked at Laris. She shook her head. Wisely, he kept silent, 
perhaps in all the confusion, he had been mistaken. You held him and saved him, of that I'm sure, Jor's mother continued. How can I thank you? An understanding passed between them. Jor's mother had already lost a son as Keldown, and a husband to the shame. Today she had nearly lost another son, the last of her family. Nothing more would be said, but things would change between them. Thank you, Rick, Jor whispered as he too understood the shift in power between them. I will never mock you again. I thought I was gone, but you saved me. And I will remind you, Jorah, if you forget, confirmed Laris. All right, so I'm going to take a little break right now. And at this point, listen to my little commercial. um, And I'll be back in a couple of minutes. During this break, I wish to ask for a donation of any amount to help me keep this podcast going. I'm fine with whatever you can afford, using whatever currency you want. I have set up a donation tab on the Crown of Bihar Stories and Poetry webpage at rss.com and a donation page on my website at www.crownofbihar.com using PayPal for your security. Don't worry about the exchange rates as PayPal takes care of that for us. If you like this podcast, please like, subscribe, and share it with everyone you know in your social circles as the writers I showcase in this podcast deserve all the exposure they can get. I created this podcast for them because I love to read their work and I believe it should be shared with the whole world. Now I want to explain how to find my website. Since this show is audio only, just write down the website name from the podcast image showing here and search for it. Visitors finding the website for the first time will reach the welcome page to learn a little bit about what's inside. You'll see the homepage link at the bottom of the page. Click on it if you wish to enter my world. Once on the homepage, you'll see the menu bar at the top where there are links to the pages in the website. Feel free to look around all you want. If you should happen to buy one of my books, all the better. Thank you for your support. Welcome back. I have two more for you. One is a short story, and then I have a poem. Um, so my, my last story, if you will, is entitled Destroyers, The Truth Will Inherit the Earth by Ziva Abraham. She published this in Tantalizing Tales. They came for all of us in the end. We stood there watching. They watched back, goggled eyes bug-like, the silence broken by the of their unified breath as it forced its way in and out of their mass. We didn't speak or shout or cry, not at the beginning. Not yet. We were frozen by expectation. We knew this day would come, and now it had. We were paralyzed. Both sides just stood, facing each other, separated by the fence. The children grew restless first, as children do. My little sister let go of my hand and tugged on my sleeve. Shireen, Shireen, I need... Oh no, not that. Not now. I extricated her insistent fingers, then patted her on the head, absent-minded as I stared at the Omnis. I remember my brother's wedding last year, smiling at the memory of my sister jogging up and down, her legs crossed. At home, in the old biscuit tin, was a photo capturing her desperation amongst the smiling family group. Always the call of the bladder. Hold it in, Carlette, I said, quiet, low, anything not to attract attention. Be a brave girl. Think what Lanson would do. She smiled, a wobbly, fragile attempt. She slowly rocked on her heels, then bounced a little, grasping my hips with her little girl arms. I'm sorry, she mouthed the words into the material of my dress, her breath warm through the rough weave. I hugged her close. She was all I had left. And so we stood. As the day lengthened and the sun forced its wintry rays through the thick atmosphere, my people began to talk amongst themselves in a low murmur. Nothing was happening. The urgency had passed. I kept my distance from the main group of younger men. Trouble was rolling off them in waves. I needed to keep my sister safe, or as safe as I could. The ringleader, San, sauntered over to me as the sun reached its zenith. Finally, free of the clouds, slung low over the horizon. The hoarfrost had finally started to melt, later than ever. It was the middle of the day. Shireen, San. He eyed me up and down, grinned at my sister menacingly. He ran his grimy fingers through his hair, cold us rising at every move. I reminded myself that these days it was impossible to keep clean. These days we were all encrusted in dust and dirt. 
but still my skin crawled. Seen your brother? No, San, not since the last time you asked. Wasn't it only yesterday? He grinned again, but a smile didn't reach his eyes. Just checking, sure, just in case. I knew what he meant. He had said it all along. Said Lanson had gone over to the Omnis, claimed his scouts had seen him weeks ago on one of the reconnaissance raids. Scouts armed with sticks and stones and two old firearms thieved from the Omnis decades ago. I hate you, hate you, hate you! Carlet hurled herself at San, beating her fist, kicking out at his shins. She wasn't stupid. She knew what he meant as well. He laughed, picking her up and holding her at arm's length, a small tornado of whirling arms and legs. The attack stopped as she subsided in a fit of coughing and spluttering, her small chest heaving as she gasped for air. We were all weak like that. The elders because of their age, the workers because of the mines, and the young, like Carlette, because all their lungs had known since they burst mewling into this world had been air solid with pollution. I remember the look on my brother's face the first time his baby daughter coughed until her face turned puce, and then as he stood over the coffins of his wife and child only months later. The elders told us the Omnis had created pollution, that our destruction was all that lay between them and the mines lying in the middle of our land, mines which were worth a fortune. They also told us the tremors were the Omnis' fault, caused by the vast turbines that they continued to erect on their land, as far as the horizon. Countless numbers have been killed in landslides in the past few years. Every day was rife with stories of new defections. Now my brother was part of the web of legends. Even though I knew he would never betray his people, I had no answer for his absence. Sand's hard shell cracked as I knew it would. He put Carlette down and we waited for the coughing to stop. Get away from the fence, Sand said, his bravado replaced with a serious look that frightened me more than his usual aggressive swagger. We're taking them down, all of them. The rumors have been true then. An attack was going to happen, a final standoff. Get all the others right back. Do it slowly. Keep it quiet. Ten minutes. Time contracted. I began hurting the sick, the old, and the young slowly, but surely away from the fence. Other women joined me. As we did this, the Omnis continued to stand statue still. <laughs> Overhead, the incessant whine of the spy drone increased as two, three, then four buzzed over our lands. I imagined the footage being back to their base, somewhere far away. I pictured a bird's-eye view of us, ant-like creatures, scattering far and wide, a cluster advancing towards the fence, yet others defending the mines. I wondered what the observers were thinking, if they had any pity for the defenseless. My stomach went into freefall. Once as I suddenly noticed Carlet's absence, twice as I spotted her wiry form running towards the fence. Carlette, come back! My voice rang out over the low murmur. The faces fell, then showed guilty relief that it wasn't their child heading into danger. Lanny, Lanny! Her thin, high voice floated on the cool wind. What? My brother? Where? One of the Omnis had removed his mask and goggles. He was crouching down, cutting the chain link with wire cutters and pushing his hand through, reaching out towards my sister. It was a clean, smiling, happy version of my brother. A betrayer! Lance and Harding! A betrayer! Sand shouted, spittle flying from his raging mouth. Time jerked forward, jumping like pictures in a flicker book. Sand raised one of the ancient firearms, grasping it with both hands, arms outstretched, rigid. I could see the veins rising on his neck, a bead of sweat rolling down his dirty cheek, leaving a white stripe in its wake. The flare as he pulled the trigger. The bloom of livid red on my brother's chest. The plume of dust as he hit the ground. I felt, didn't hear myself scream. I watched myself run, scooping my sister's face into my shoulder, hiding the destruction from her eyes. Too late for her heart. I couldn't look at his face. Lanny's eyes were blank. My brother was gone. In his hand, outstretched, still reaching out to Carlette, was a crumpled piece of paper filled with his spidery handwriting. San, the elders, they've all been lying to you. The Omnis don't want the mines. They don't want the pollution. They don't want to fill our skies with smoke and dust. They want clean air, energy made from wind. Imagine. They want to rescue us. Come with me. Grasping my sister tightly, I looked up at the turbines on the horizon. Saviors, not destroyers after all. The screaming, the crying, the noise, the dirt on our side of the fence hit me like a truck. On the other side, there was peace, 
an array of outstretched hands, faces free of masks, turned sympathetically towards us. I made my choice, and carrying my sister, strode toward the other side. Others would follow, eventually. My last is a poem entitled When the Ravens Drop by Farida Haik. For Gaza. And it's, she's got a little kind of a, a description here. Gaz, derived from Arabic gaz, G-A-Z-Z, which means raw silk. For centuries, Gaza weavers have been weaving the finest gauze. I love to watch the ravens come, children shrieked when the ravens dropped, flowers closed as the ravens fell, green-eyed cats turned, sinew and stealth. Ravens ate what children threw and flopped away as the bulbul sang. Like shards of hematite, frozen ravens sit in a muttered sleep, cobwebbed by smoke, a full moon hangs. Festooned with shame and borrowed light in a dust and penumbra, it drags itself and cohort celestial bodies along deep saffron immensities of unholy indifference. How can they not moan, these constellations, and fall stumble at the very least, these stars, guarantors of safe passages? What a betrayal, I tell you, what a betrayal. On a tattered beach, carbon tears of war-torn winds are falling. They fall, fall, fall on roses of fresh blood, a bloom in creosote and sand. Irises and turtle doves, all but forgotten, in peace, a veiled ghost, a blunderer gropes for a foothold, obscene in its blindness. And the dead can't see where ravens tear. The dead won't weep or dream or care. Ravens, they came in blue-black glints. They dipped, they rose, they flapped, they saw. On dog-tired feet sat a city of bones wrapped in a shroud of soft white gauze. Over there unsung, ashen winds singed, drooped and grim as a fallen raven, thirsty beak broken, curled bloody claws, stretched on the rack of a final question, choked on the one split second granted from martyr to martyr. Was it a leaf or a Salama's butterfly? It will never know. Do thousands of guns record dying thoughts of children they murder? I wonder. What a world, I tell you. What a world. Gone, all gone. Children they starved. Children they burned. Children they defiled. Infants they smashed. Devils they laughed. Bread forgotten. Waters emptied. Bubbles garroted. Rosebushes melted. Mothers raped. Their dream waters purpled. Left is no sun, no air, no rain. No rest, no sleep. No smiles, nor grace. Plundered by those whose children breathe, and pearly smiles sweeten their dreams. And you? A wasteland of pulverized teeth. Go, all you acrobats of obsidian contentiousness. Go with high sunbirds, angels, our children, their sisters, mothers, fathers, and brothers. Fly away, ravens. Go sing with gazelles, where night herons stride, and thyme and olive sit awed by gild and dawns. Watch dust turn pink. Rise on waves of seared undulations, rise like burnt pages of alphabet books, laughter and teachers, all gone, all gone. Rise like leaves of desecrated tomes, rise like prayers pried free of guns, small hopes held captive far too long, rise like ribbons of indigo gauze, that magic of healing, bright fingers thrummed, but none left for you, O Gaza, O Gaza, my chatter of gauze, I lay at your feet. Your phantom fingers we pain unto me. From Nineveh to Rome, Persopolis and Bibulos, prized and precious for all who bled. Rise as one, a force majeure. Rise as Stygian storms of sands. Go, scratch and smash, the inscrutable and familiar. When was it we lost him? Where was it he lost us? Pearl of Farrago, where silence sits, carrying him back on wings given voices. Of Merlin's Falcons and laughing doves, too, bring him back here, where death holds sway, where death holds sway, where death, death. Does the world mourn? Yes, it does. Does the world turn? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. That it does. And that's all I have for you. Um, she does have a note on here, in case you don't know what a charter is. Uh, it's spelled C-H-A-D-D-A-R, a large shawl worn a large shawl women wear in my culture. It's a symbol of honor and of a woman's essence. It signifies respect for oneself and others. And so that's all I have for you this week. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, you can take away something from all of this. 
some good stories and some lessons learned maybe. And again, a poem and tribute to all of the 40,000 some odd dead in Gaza. Um, with that, I'll, I'll leave you and I'll be back again next week. Slantia. Guru Mahagat, thank you for listening to the show today. I hope you enjoyed the variety of stories and poems again this week. If you like the show, please like, subscribe, and reply, as this goes a long way towards reaching more listeners around the world. As a Sean K, I hope you will allow me to continue delighting you with a story or poem here under the crown of Biha. Maybe they will bring you a smile and take you away from your troubles for a time. As I say goodbye this week, I wish to leave you with this Irish blessing as you go about your day. May your path rise up to meet you, and the sun warm your bonnet as you walk down the lane to the pub. May your friends or relations bring you a pint after you retell these stories and poems I give you here. Slongo foil. Goodbye for now. <laughs>